The next presentation is there, is there an illusory correlation between the dismissal of abuse allegations and parental alienation? Hassam Farabay. Uh, is my voice coming through good? All right, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Hassan Rave. I'm a first year graduate PhD student here at CSU and I work with uh, Dr. Jennifer Harmon. And today I'm gonna share with you the project that I've been working on um, this past year. And that's about how illusory correlations perpetuate the failure to acknowledge parental alienation, not only in the court system, but also in public policy as well. So um, pretty much I think everyone here knows this, but just in case new listeners, maybe someone um, doesn't know, parental alienation, a good broad summary of it is that um, it's a reluctance or refusal of a child to have a relationship with a specific parent who is known as the alienated parent due to the illogical, untrue, or exaggerated reasons influenced onto them by the other parent who would be the alienating parent. So the alienating parent influences the child to either have a negative relationship or in some cases no relationship with the alienated parent. The other key term that we dealt with in this project was an illusory correlation. So what that is is it's a report of a correlation between two classes of events or two events that are either not correlated, correlated in the opposite direction, or um, correlated to a lesser extent. And this initial concept was found in 1967 where a study found that a lot of people associated a majority population with positive characteristics and negative characteristics with a minority population with the reasoning being that they might see it maybe happen one time and they would extrapolate that to this happens all, all the time. Uh, this effect is usually shown uh, using contingency tables, so I'm going to give a quick example to show how that works. So there's that belief out there that when there's a full moon, there's more hospital admissions or there's like a higher rate of them. And uh, so in that case, you would think this A square here would have a higher number than the rest, when in reality, obviously, someone maybe just see, maybe there's a random day or a random week where during a full moon there are a lot more hospital admissions, but realistically there's no real pattern there. So in reality, either there's usually the pattern of this would be either all or similar numbers or the A square is actually less than the other. So that's kind of what an illusory correlation is. That's what we're going to look at um, in this project. So the background of this um, specifically, um, so there's a lot of studies out there. I think a previous presentation mentioned this. Uh, there's a lot of studies out there that don't uh, recognize parental alienation as a scientific concept, but instead uh, look at it as it's like a strategy used by fathers in courts to kind of... Um, showcase the bias of the, of the court and go against abuse allegations made by mothers. And these cases, you, uh, these studies, sorry, usually um, make two main claims. So one is that um, there's a large number of court cases that affect this idea, meaning that there's a large number of court cases that have a finding of both parental alienation and abuse. Um, and in those cases, um, building off of that, they say that these lead to the mother um, losing custody due to the court showing a bias. So an example of this having an effect on public perception and um, the public um, atmosphere in, in the whole is, I went and looked and found some articles, so two in the United States uh, through Forbes, one looked at uh, why women lose custody and the other looked at how alienation is a defense to allegations of domestic violence and uh, child sexual abuse. And in both these uh, articles, they, they cite those sources and they talk about how this is like the new upcoming, or uh, new like trending way that some fathers, abusive fathers are, are gaining custody of children. Similarly, in the UK, um, I found three articles that kind of talk about the same thing as well as also questioning the experts and the evaluators in those cases. So these are all from The Guardian in the UK. Um, the caveat here is that these are all written by the same person, which means obviously there's an agenda there. But I just want to showcase that um, there's a lot of public influence that could be taken from these uh, articles out there. So once again, the, the two claims uh, where there's a large number of court cases re reflect this idea and that these court cases result in the mother losing custody. I think there was supposed to be an animation, but, but we, can, we can work with it. Uh, so for the, the purpose of this was to test whether mothers really are losing custody to abusive fathers who have claimed to have been alienated from their children. So for the method, um, initially I went through 1,500 Canadian court cases and I found 200, that, that's what our sample size was, where the father had made an allegation of alienation and the, and the an allegation of abuse had been made against the father, meaning that the father had been alleged of either abusing the mother, child, or a combination. Um, and also, these are, just to be more clear, these are only an allegation, not a finding. It's just an allegation of both concepts within a, a single court case. Um, then, uh, me and other coders, we coded each of these cases using a form that would evaluate each separate abuse allegation. So this could range from some um, Court cases had maybe only one abuse allegation. Some had up to 30 or 50 separate abuse allegations, and we used a form to code those, and I'll show the form in a second. Um, but using the forms and the, 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 respective, the, the case in the respective forms, we uh, collected three data points. One was, was parental alienation uh, found by the court, was abuse found by the court, and did the mother lose custody? 
So this is the form I was mentioning earlier. I'm just quickly go briefly through it. So we kind of specified the case number, what the allegation number was, some specifics about it, where it says type of abuse alleged, where it says domestic violence. There was a drop down menu where you could choose child sexual abuse, child physical abuse, other forms, and you could specify what it was. Um, who made the allegation? Usually this was the mother, but it could be the child. It could be someone else like the mother's maybe new spouse. Um, who the allegation was made to was either always the court, uh, the police, or the CAS, Child Aid Society. Uh, the accused party was always the father, and alleged victim was always either the mother, child, children, or a combination. Now we would talk more about uh, more specifics. So was there maybe a restraining order made? What was the evidence? Um, who looked into it? So who investigated it? Usually this was either the police or the Child Aid Society. And then what did they find? Did they arrest the father? Was there no evidence? Was there evidence? And if the court was involved, uh, what did they find? Was it founded, not founded? What did the judge say um, according to that case? So for the table itself, I don't think it was supposed to be read, but okay. Um, for the, for the, so for the first claim I talked about, um, it was, um, there's a large number of cases that, that showcase this, this fact that there's this phenomena that there's both a finding of alienation and abuse. So here, this is the contingency table we use for that. So the top is um, when alienation is claimed by the father, was it found by the court, not found by the court? And the side part is um, when abuse was alleged against the father, was that found or not found? And the number one to we'll focus on here is six. So in only six of the 200 cases, was there a finding of alienation and abuse within the same um, uh, case, which is obviously very rare in that sense, and it kind of goes against the claims that are being made. Uh, the rest of the patterns are pretty, I guess, um, normal, half of it where it was not found in both, and about 50-50 where one was not found and one it wasn't. But the main number is at 6 out of 200 with that had a finding of both. And then leading on to the second claim, which was do these co uh, cases lead to the mother losing custody? We did a logistic regression here, so for the predictors was when alienation was found by the court and abuse found by the court, and the outcome variable was did the mother lose custody. So the numbers we want to focus on here is first, when alienation was found, uh, the odds of the mother losing custody was 3.8, and when abuse was found, there was an almost zero odds that the mother would lose custody. So pretty much any time um, abuse was found by the court in these cases, it was almost, it was like super rare that, that the mother would end up losing custody. Our initial plan was to um, make an interaction term where we would, multi uh, we would look at both of them because we wanted to see when alienation and abuse are both found, uh, what, are the, um, what is the odds of the mother losing custody then. But since I just showed in the table that there's only six cases that had that happening, um, the statistics wouldn't be significant enough. So instead, I went through all six of those cases and I looked at, okay, um, did the mother lose custody in any of them? And if they did, was there bias? What was going on there? So in only one of the six cases did the mother end up losing custody, and system was only one. Uh, I went ahead and just let's do a quick case study through it, look through it and see um, was there a bias there, was there a reasoning, or, or was it unreasonable? So this case, this individual case, was about a mother and father with three children. Um, they both alleged alienation against the other, and the court found that they both had attempted to alienate the children from the other. On two separate occasions, the mother alleged that the father had assaulted her. In 2005, he was arrested and a restraining order was made. But the, um, the father pleaded guilty, and his reasoning was that he did that just to remove the restraining order. Later in 2016, he was also charged with assault again. But due to not being enough evidence, he was released. But since it had been reported a few times, he was released with no access to the matrimonial house. Um, so due to these reasonings, the, the judge decided, okay, I'm going to let the children decide who they go with in terms of the custody decision. So the father was granted custody of the oldest child uh, due to the fact that they want to go with him, and the mother was granted custody of the other children. So even in the one case, I guess out of the whole 200, where the mother did lose custody, she still maintained custody of two of her three children. So once again, just going through the conclusions, those two claims again. So do a large number of court cases reflect this idea that there's a finding of alienation and abuse? And no, we found the only six cases out of the 200, which is 3%, had that. And do these court cases result in the mother losing custody? As I just explained, only one case that involved a finding of abuse and parental alienation led to the mother losing custody. And, and even then, as I just showed, the mother still maintained uh, custody of two of her three children. So. Uh, what are some strengths of this study and why do we think uh, it was a good idea and, and, and what do we feel was good about it? So one was that these are trial level court cases in Canada. So these are everyday level court cases. Um, kind of shown by the fact that earlier I mentioned I went through up to 1,500 um, court cases to even find our sample of 200. So it's obviously kind of um, relatively rare for it to happen. And also another strength, well, these, are all, uh, these were selected on a, in a sequential order. So when we started looking at it, we started from the earliest point of the database and we went until we hit our 200. So from May 2020 to February 2015. And that included, like um, they like mentioned earlier, sometimes a court case might return back to court. So it's good that we looked at the earliest ruling instead of um, seeing like duplicate cases. 
And then just once again, just reiterating that the ultimate result is that one case that involved the finding of both alienation and abuse led to the mother losing custody. And that shows an illusory correlation could be present here because people might take this one case where it did happen and then kind of extrapolate that to, to this happens all the time. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, um, these type of studies are having an impact on public policy. And one uh, public law, I think many of you guys may know, but I'm not sure, is uh, Caden's Law, which I believe is a law in um, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and New York. So I'm going to quickly explain what that is. So the law itself was based on a court case about Kaden Mancuso, who was a 70-year-old girl whose parents were in a custody um, trial. And the father um, has, was alleged to be aggressive, so then the evaluators went in and looked at him, and they found that although he did show aggressive tendencies towards others, um, he had no um, issue or no bad relationship with the child. So the judge in, uh, essentially gave um, joint custody. Unfortunately, soon after, the, the father murdered the child, and then after that, um, there was obviously a lot of uproar, people were upset, so the judge ended up being sued uh, for that. But that case was thrown out due to the fact that the court decision by the evaluators as well as the judge was made in compliance with Pennsylvania law. And for more proof of that, I mean, the fact that um, that happened was it was not appealed by either party, meaning that at the time of the decision, um, neither party um, really appealed it. So the law itself, what it does is it puts uh, more of an emphasis on child abuse allegations as well as tighter restrictions on evaluators and experts. But the one thing that I guess could be amended about it is how it approaches parental alienation. So in the law itself, it mentions uh, scientifically unsound theories that are used by fathers in courts to kind of minimize um, abuse allegations by mothers. And the, I guess the issue with this was that in the initial case itself, um, parental alienation was not mentioned at all. But even though that was the case, um, it kind of became a poster child for anti-alienation. So a lot of advocates and reporters, um, they use like cases like this where they might change up the facts or change up some of the uh, things that happen in there, like, like inserting alienation to kind of show that, oh, this happens all the time and that there should be more laws um, outlawing um, alienation. And like going against that, as I just showed in this project, it's obviously very rare for alienation to even play uh, maybe even a negative role in, in any court cases. So I guess the final question would be uh, if you are um, maybe changing up story, changing up facts, giving half-truths, or even uh, lying in some cases, uh, are your claims and agendas actually based in reality? So that will be it for me. Uh, thank you so much. If anyone has questions, um, you can reach out to me.